Now, what if we have more than one charge? In all of these examples, we had one charge and we figured out the electric field at some different points, three different points. What if we have more than one charge? How do we figure out the electric field due to two or three or more charges? Well, I won't calculate these. Hopefully you are familiar with, with this approach. I'll just tell you how to do it. Let's imagine we've got a charge, say, here, Q1, a charge here, Q2. Let's just say Q1 is a positive charge and Q2 is a negative charge. What's the electric field, say, at this point here? How would we figure that out? How do we figure out the electric field? Well, first we would figure out the electric field at that point due to Q1. And that's just like the kind of problem we just did. We would get something that looked like this. We know this is positive, and so we would get an electric field that pointed directly away from Q1. We would end up with something like that. We might call that E1, the component of the electric field due to Q1. What's the electric field due to Q2? Well, Q2 is negative. We're going to end up with an electric field, or part of the electric field, pointing toward Q2 because it's negative. And so we would end up with a part of the electric field that pointed, say, in that direction. So this would be the part of the electric field due to Q1. This would be the electric field, or part of the electric field due to Q2. What's the total electric field? It would be the sum of these two components. We would have to add these two parts to get the total electric field. We could do that quantitatively by finding the components, the xy components of E1, finding the xy components of E2, combine the x components, combine the y components, and that would give you the x and y components of the sum. Graphically, we, can, we know we can add vectors using the, trap, uh, the uh, uh, parallelogram rule, the law of vector addition, uh, by taking the tail of E1, putting it on the head of E2, and get something like that. Or we could take the tail of E2, put it on the head of E1, and get something like that. And the sum of the two would then be a vector that went from here to here, and that would be our net result, the total electric field due to the two charges. And so that would be a way that we could find. And then if we had another one, just add in another vector, add in as many vectors as uh, charges we have. So that would be a way of determining the electric field if we had, excuse me, more than one charge. All right, now let's get back to looking at uh, the electric field in a quantitative way. There's a method of determining electric fields, kind of like we did here, but uh, a little bit more generally, for figuring out what the electric field looks like, the electric field vector, what it looks like for combinations of charges. And these are called field line drawings. Now, there are three points to keep in mind when making a field line drawing. Okay, the first point to keep in mind is that the field lines indicate the direction of the electric field. The second is that the magnitude of the electric field is proportional to, and I'm using this symbol, hopefully we're familiar with that, uh, this means proportional to, the magnitude of the electric field is proportional to the density of lines. So, if we've got a region where the lines are relatively far apart, this means we've got a weak field. If we've got a region where the lines are relatively close together, this means we have a strong field. So, the, the spacing between the fields will give us an idea, uh, I should say, the spacing between the lines will give us an idea of the strength of the field. And then, one more point. And that is that the lines start on positive charges, end on negative charges, or 
infinity. So typically if you have a positive charge, lines will start there and go out. If you have a negative charge, lines will go into the neg negative charge. Or you can have lines that will go out to infinity or lines that come in from infinity. Uh, and the number of lines is proportional to the magnitude of the charge. So this kind of comes back to this point here, the magnitude of the electric field is proportional to the density of lines. We know that if we've got bigger charges, we've got a stronger field, that means more lines. So the number of lines coming out of a charge or going into a charge will be proportional to the magnitude of that charge. All right, so let's try some examples. Let's try some, uh, some field line drawings. We've already made a couple, although we didn't exactly call them that, for two individual point charges. If we have just a positive charge, the field line drawing looks something like this, just a, a charge with the lines coming out of the positive charge. If we have a negative charge, we've got basically something very similar, but we've got lines going into the negative charge. So those are actually field line drawings for a positive point charge and a negative point charge. Well, let's try a combination of these two. Let's imagine we have a positive charge and a negative charge. What's the field going to look like for this combination of charges? We'll start out with exactly what, what I just erased. So we'll start out with the lines coming out of the positive charge. So here are the lines coming out of the positive charge. Now let's assume that the magnitude of these two charges are the same. So this might be plus one coulomb, this would be minus one coulomb. This could be plus one microcoulomb, then this would be minus one microcoulomb. So whatever the charges are, let's assume that they have the same magnitude. The same magnitude means they must have the same number of lines. I've drawn this one with eight lines coming out, so I'm going to have to draw this one with eight lines going in. There we go. Now we just connect up the lines. So I'm going to draw this one across here. This one like this, this one like this, here, 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 and then this one is going to go out to infinity and this one is going to come in from infinity. And there we go. The, uh, not quite symmetric. Uh, this one maybe should have looked a little bit more like that to make it look like the line I drew below. So there we go, maybe something like that. Okay, this is the field of what we call an electric dipole. A dipole meaning two poles or two point charges. So this is the electric field of two point charges, an electric dipole. And this is a very, very important result. We'll come back to this. We'll use electric dipoles uh, more later on. But this is what the electric field would look like for an electric dipole. Now, uh, one thing I want you to notice is that these lines never cross each other. So we do not have a region where the lines do something like that. Now, why not? Well, remember, the direction of the lines tell us the direction of the electric field. And at a point like this, that would seem to indicate that the electric field was pointing in two directions. Well, we're talking about the total electric field, the electric field from the combination of all the charges, and so we really should have just the electric field in one direction. What's the net force acting on a, on a test charge that we were to put at that point? Well, the force has to point in just one direction, so the electric field has to point in just one direction. So we can't have electric fields crossing each other like this. They, uh, that would indicate uh, two different directions at the same point, which uh, we can't have. So there's the uh, electric field for an electric dipole. Let's try two similar charges rather than two opposite charges. Let's try, say, two positive charges. Let's imagine we've got, say, 
uh, one microcoulomb and another plus one microcoulomb. So we'll start out again the same. We'll draw in the lines coming out of this one and lines coming out of this one. And again, if it's the same magnitude, we've got to have the same number of lines. Okay, now let's connect up the lines. Well, we've got to be careful because we've got lines going in opposite directions here. So what's going to happen there? Well, I'm just going to leave that for a second. These are going this way. Now they can't cross, so they actually have to bend away from each other. Something like that. There we go. Now, what about here in the middle? Well, from symmetry, there's no place these can go other than straight towards each other. And the fact of the matter is that up here, the electric field is going to point straight up away from these, and so the electric field has to go like that, and so I'm just going to bring these in here to that point, and I'll talk about that in just a second. There we go. So there's the electric field. We can draw some more arrows here, like that, and there's the electric field for two similar charges uh, with the same magnitude. Now, what's going on here? I said that electric field lines cannot cross, but it certainly looks like they're crossing here. But the fact is, if you think about it, if I were to take a test charge, where's my little test charge? If I were to take a test charge and put it right there, what would the force be that acts on that test charge? This charge would push it that way, this charge would push it that way. If it were right in the center, the net force would be zero. And so although it looks like these electric field lines cross, the fact of the matter is that right at that point, the electric field is zero. There is no field at that point, or you could say the value is zero. So these are kind of coming in and bending away from each other, but right at that point, the electric field is zero, so it, it's, it's like they're really not crossing at that point. Now, something I, I would like us to do is think about what would this field look like if we were very, very far away. Imagine that we were to take the camera and back way, way up. What would this field look like? Well, I'm going to try and draw it <clears throat> over here, kind of small. Imagine the, that you're looking at it very, very far away. These charges would appear to be closer and closer and closer together until they're basically right on top of each other, and all you would see would be these lines coming out. Well, how many lines do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So very far away, you would have something that looked kind of like this. Whoops. With 16 lines coming out. Coming straight out from the point in the center. Well, what does that look like? Well, that looks like a point charge with a magnitude that creates 16 lines. Well, one of these charges created eight lines, so that charge must be twice as big. Well, that's just what we would think. If you've got these two charges, imagine you've got a Coulomb here and a Coulomb here. If you're far enough away, basically these look like two Coulombs right on top of each other. <clears throat> this electric field line drawing is going to look like the electric field line drawing of a single charge of two Coulombs if you're far enough away. So, that kind of makes sense. The, uh, the symmetry of this drawing would seem to indicate uh, just that, and that's the kind of idea that we would expect uh, if we were to look at this far enough away. Let's try one more. Let's look at uh, two charges, but of uh, different magnitudes. <clears throat> Let's imagine we've got a positive charge and a negative charge. 
But now let's imagine that the positive charge is twice as large as the negative charge. And so the negative charge, uh, uh, sorry, so the positive charge will have twice as many lines coming off of it as the negative charge. So what do we get? We'll get something like this. Let's have, uh, say, eight lines going into the negative charge. And then 16 lines coming off of the positive charge. Okay. There we go. So, there are, there are our lines. How do we connect them up? Well, we just connect them one at a time. Now this is going to the right and this is going to the right, so we'll just connect these right up like that. This is coming out here. We'll connect the second one to the second one. The third one to the third one. Okay, here. 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 Ooh, let's see. Now wait a second. We've got these coming out here and this one coming in here. What happens to those? Well, these are going to go up like this. Okay, what happens to these two? We've got one coming in here, two coming out here. Well, the fact of the matter is this is going to come over here. This is going to come over here. And then this is going to go in there and go out there. Okay. We get something similar to that point that we found in between the two positive charges, but we've got something a little bit different going on here. We've got these two lines coming in and then dividing off and going out like that. Again, this is going to be a point where the electric field is zero. Now, how is that possible? Well, you are farther from a larger positive charge, closer to a smaller negative charge, it turns out there is one point over here where the repulsive, or I should say the electric field pointing away from the positive, will be exactly canceled out from the electric field going toward the negative because this is a larger magnitude, that's a smaller magnitude. There will be a, for, a point where those two exactly cancel out. And so we end up with a distribution that looks like this. Now, again, what would this look like very far away? Well, far away, we've got how many lines coming out? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines coming out from our uh, charge combination. So very far away, we would end up with something that looked like this. Basically, the two charges would get, mushed, whoops, would get mushed together and you wouldn't be able to distinguish the fact that there were two charges, but we would end up with eight lines coming out. Well, does that make sense? Well, notice, uh, we've got a charge of, let's say, negative one Coulomb here, a charge of plus two Coulombs here, plus two minus one is plus one, one Coulomb created eight lines, and there we go. We've got basically a point charge of one Coulomb creating eight lines, exactly what we've got if we are far enough away from this distribution, basically uh, the field of a single positive Coulomb charge. Now, just a couple more points. Uh, earlier we talked about some different types of materials, and in particular we talked about conductors, and conductors are those kind of materials in which uh, electrons can move freely. Now what I'd like to do is just talk about what happens to conductors in the presence of uh, an electric field. Let's imagine we've got, say, a conductor that looks like this. So this might be a piece of aluminum or a piece of copper or something like that. Something that has uh, a number of free electrons in it that can move about freely. And let's imagine that we put this in the presence of an electric field. Let's imagine we've got an electric field that maybe looks like that. So what's going to happen to the, the charges inside the conductor? We've got these electrons that can move around freely. Well, those electrons are going to experience a force due to the electric field. 
Remember, electric field, the direction of the electric field tells us the direction of a force that would act on a positive test charge. The electrons are negative, and so they're going to experience a force in the opposite direction. So the electrons are going to be pulled to the left side. So we're going to end up with a bunch of electrons over here on the left side of the conductor, leaving the right side of the conductor with fewer electrons, basically making a positive charge over on the right side. These positive charges will create an electric field in this direction. The negative charges will create an electric field towards them. So these two charges will create an electric field in the opposite direction to this electric field and will essentially cancel out the external electric field so that there is no electric field inside the conductor. Now, how do we know that these electric fields must exactly cancel out? If there was some residual electric field inside the conductor, there would be electrons that experienced a force and would move against that electric field, increasing the amount of charge on this side, increasing the amount of positive charge on this side, creating more electric field in the opposite direction, and essentially to cancel that out. So there is no electric field inside the conductor, or there would be charges moving around inside the conductor. As soon as the charges stop moving, we know there must be no electric field inside. So what does that leave us? That tells us that inside, inside the physical material of the conductor, we must have zero electric field or else we'd have charges moving around. That creates charges on the surface of the conductor. Um, okay, so we've got those two points. We've got zero electric field inside the conductor creating surface charges on the surface of the conductor. This is due to some external electric field. Now, what does the electric field look like at the surface of the conductor? Imagine uh, we've got some electric field due to these positive charges, some electric field due to some external field. Maybe we've got some electric field that looks like that. That electric field we could break down into a component perpendicular to the surface and parallel to the surface. Now, charges can move parallel to the surface and stay within the conductor. And so, if there was a force acting parallel to the surface, Charges would move in response to that force and then uh, balance out the electric field. It would, it would um, uh, cancel out whatever electric field there was. So, assuming that we have waited long enough, we've put this conductor in the electric field, we've waited long enough for no more charges to be moving, there must not be any component of the electric field parallel to the surface or else more charges would move. So, that tells us then that any electric field at the surface of the conductor can only be perpendicular to the surface. So, there are three things to remember about the conductors, the conductor in a, an external electric field. There is no electric field inside the material of the conductor. Uh, charge densities build up on the surface of the conductor. And any electric field at the edge of the conductor is going to be perpendicular to the surface with no parallel component. That's all for lecture number three. I'll see you next time in lecture number four.